I am an educator with an interest in teaching students in the life sciences. A few years ago, I learned of a statistic that has impacted the way I teach. 60% of high school graduates who go on to college with a major in STEM, and by STEM I mean science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, 60% of those students will change to non-science before they graduate. And that's not because there are no jobs in STEM. One study predicted that of the 8 million jobs that there would be in STEM by the year 2018, one and a half million of those would be newly created within the past decade. With so many students leaving STEM in college, we may not be able to provide enough qualified college graduates for those jobs as they leave. Perhaps some of you at one time were STEM majors who switched, or maybe you have family members who are currently facing this dilemma of staying in STEM. If we could hold on to just 10% of that number, if we could keep just 10% of that 60% from switching out of STEM, we would be able to prevent deficits in the STEM workforce. But to do that, we need to find out why they are leaving STEM in the first place. Although there is not just one simple answer, there was one thing that piqued my interest as an educator. Why is it that these high school students with a passion for science, who see themselves as discoverers, finding maybe the cure to cancer, why are they leaving science as soon as they get to college? <clears throat> in order to address this, then, I realized there was something that I, as an educator, could do. You see, when many of these students enter college, we put them into classes in which they have to memorize a lot of scientific facts. They don't have a chance... To, they, they are put into labs where there is no independent or creative thought. For example, I used to teach an introduction to biology lab. Everyone did the same experiment. Everyone got the same result, everyone wrote the same lab report, and at the end of the hour, everyone left feeling the same way, bored to death. <laughs> Why would they want to stay in STEM if all we ever do is have them memorize scientific facts? Is there something that we could do to change that? Is there something we could do to increase the chance that they would stay in STEM? The idea that I had involved independent research in, this, in, in STEM for these students by providing that, these students might have a passion for research and might stay within it. What I was looking for then was an authentic research experience, one that would be engaging and one that would encourage them to do independent lab research, maybe even addressing a global health issue. Let me switch tracks for a moment and share with you an example of what I mean by a global health issue. Ninety years ago, a British scientist named Alexander Fleming discovered the first antibiotic, penicillin. Antibiotics are chemicals that are produced in nature by microbes. Microbes have to compete with one another for limited resources, and by so doing, they have evolved mechanisms that are similar to a key and lock in order to compete. Imagine that the antibiotic is a key, and the lock is a protein produced by a competing species. The antibiotic attaches to that protein, inactivating it, and by so doing, then, can eliminate its competition from the population. But these proteins are made of genes, and genes are encoded by DNA. All it takes is a random mutation in that protein to slightly change its shape. Then the antibiotic can no longer interact with it. We say that the second species has become resistant, and it goes on competing. However, that's not the end of the story. Just as likely as a mutation can happen in the second species, another mutation can happen in the first species to change the shape of the antibiotic, so that now that interaction continues and the competition goes on. It is a war that has been going on for millions of years. As soon as one, antibiotic, as soon as one species becomes resistant, the other spe species produces a new antibiotic to compete against that. In fact, within five years of the discovery of penicillin, there were already bacteria that had become resistant to it. In the past, the answer has always been, as uh, species become resistant, we just have to find new antibiotics. And that has been the answer for many years, until recently. Within the past 35 years, the number of new antibiotics being approved for use in human medicine is dwindling. Even within the last 10 years, only a few antibiotics have been approved. The number of new chemicals entering the pipeline of research and de development is also on the decline. There are some who believe that there are no new antibiotics to be discovered. They predict that by the year 2050, if we have no new antibiotics, there will be 10 million deaths a year worldwide due to infectious diseases that today would be easily treated with an antibiotic. 
I believe that evolution has not let us down, that there are new antibiotics being produced all the time as species evolve. All we need is an army of scientific discoverers to go out and find them. But where would we find such an army? Do you remember when I mentioned that I was looking for a project for my college students? It dawned on me that I already had the recruits in my college lab. All I had to do was enlist them in the army of scientific discovery. A colleague of mine, Joe Handelsman, had an idea to involve college students in independent lab research as early as their first semester and to do so while addressing a global issue of antimicrobial resistance. The pathway of persistence in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics of STEM persistence intersected with the pathway of antibiotic discovery. She founded a network of faculty members and students who were looking for new antibiotics where they are, literally where they are in the soil beneath their feet. I joined this network, and in 2014, I began teaching my students this lab. The lab works essentially like this. On the second week of the semester, the students bring a soil sample with them to the lab. They can collect this soil sample anywhere, even their own backyard. The first time I ran this was during a typical Idaho winter. It had been below freezing for several weeks, and the ground was completely frozen. <laughs> there were a few students who asked me, how am I supposed to find live bacteria in frozen soil? I learned that the, that the soil is a healthy ecosystem of microbes. They collected their frozen soil and brought it to lab, and they found that there were thousands of bacteria as they isolated them from the soil. These bacteria were thriving in this environment. Over the next few weeks, they characterized as many different species as possible, and they categorized them in order to set up a lab, an experiment to do antibiotic production. The way that we do this is as follows. We set up an, an artificial environment in the lab in which we grow the soil isolates next to other bacteria, contaminant bacteria. Now, these bacteria do not cause disease, but they are closely related to those which do cause human diseases. By growing them together in an artificial environment, they have to compete for the same limited resource. Now, this is not just two friends who come together for lunch. This is all-out war. What we notice that it is in some instances that around the soil isolate, there is a clear zone. There is no growth going on there. That means that these bacteria are producing a chemical that prevents the growth of any other thing. Voila, an antibiotic. In the years that I've been doing this with my students, I've had nearly 3,000 students go through my lab, and about two-thirds of them have identified antibiotics. And as exciting as that is, what's even more exciting to me is the passion that I see in my students. They come to lab and they begin working even before the lab instructor tells them what to do for the day. They get out their results and they share them with one another. They communicate with one another. They talk and they think like scientists. They take ownership of this project. Oftentimes I hear them say, these are my bacteria, that they own these bacteria. <laughs> they are making discoveries that no one has ever made before. I will always remember the one student who came to me and told me that at the start of the semester, she wasn't sure if she was going to stay in STEM. But after this lab, she said, now I know I belong in STEM. After establishing this network in the United States and Canada, we realized that antibiotic discovery was not just a problem to be solved by two nations. And so we began training professors from around the world. A few years ago, while I was the chairman of this network, I traveled to the Middle East, where, with my colleague Simon Hernandez, he and I trained in a workshop faculty members from six different universities in Iraq. These seven professors had come to learn how to do this lab, and we essentially put them through the same lab that my students go through. On the first day, they collected a soil sample, and they brought it into the laboratory. From there, they isolated bacteria, and they looked for antibiotic producers. They have now since returned to their universities in Iraq, and they are now teaching this to college students throughout Iraq. For a country that is rebuilding after nearly a decade of war, it is inspiring that they are investing in the future of science in that nation. We are now a network of over 10,000 high school and college students and their faculty who are in search of new antibiotics. As we do so, we are publishing our results on the website so we can share our results in a global environment. We have taken a global, universal uh, database, a diversity of bacteria, and we are unifying them into a tiny Earth network. It shouldn't be long now before we start to find chemicals that can enter the pipeline for research and development to find the next generation of antibiotics. 
After doing this lab with, with my students, I realized that there was more that I could reach out to. And recently, I've taken an interest in university outreach to my local high school to make an impact in STEM education at the K-12 level. I realize that the high schools in this rural community do not have the budgets to set up this antibiotic discovery lab. And it occurred to me that maybe I could bring the lab to them. So last year, I piloted a program in which two of my college students who have previously been through this lab, we collected all the supplies and we went to a local high school. And with those students, we spent an hour a week with them doing the antibiotic discovery program. On the first week, the students brought a soil sample with them from wherever they chose, some in their own backyards. They brought them to the lab, and over the next five weeks, we did this abbreviated form of this lab. The students, this classroom of 12 high school students, discovered 49 antibiotics. These are high school students who realize that they can make significant discoveries, that they can make the world a safer place. And perhaps some of these high school students will go on to college and major in STEM, and they will be part of that 10% that will be retained as STEM majors through graduation. In the audience today are some of my current and former students who have participated in this antibiotic discovery network. You are the superheroes saving the world one bacterium at a time. If there are science educators who are interested in an independent research lab for your students, you can join the network, receive training, and bring this lab to your students. But if you're not a scientist, but you have an interest in antimicrobial resistance, and all of us should have an interest in antimicrobial resistance, <laughs> there are citizen science programs being established all over the world where any of you can bring a soil sample from your favorite location, even your own backyard. Bring it to a lab, we will isolate the bacteria, and we will identify any antibiotics for you. The next time you're standing on a doormat, ready to go inside, think twice before wiping your feet. <laughs> Because the soil on the bottom of your shoe just might contain bacteria producing new antibiotics, antibiotics that might one day save your life.